So we're going to start now with the second part of our panel on governance. So I would like to remind you, or for those who weren't here yesterday, I would like to tell you that yesterday a number of questions were posed, which didn't get, some of them got answered, some of them are still there sitting on the table. So the dynamic that we're going to follow today is as follows. First of all, I'm going to pass the floor to the members of the advisory committee for this panel. Each will have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk. They're going to be talking about their vision, how they see things, their assessment, their conclusions in relation to the Torquesune Reikis initiative. Telmo uh, will also be joining us. They're just bringing him a chair. This is uh, what we decided yesterday that Telmo was going to come up here to give his point of view in uh, sort of on behalf of young people and how they assess the initiative and how they think at what extent uh, do they find the Torquesune Reikis initiative attractive in terms of collaborative governance. So as soon as he's being brought a chair, the poor bloke, he's standing there waiting at the side of the stage. But as soon as uh, the chair has been brought for him, he will be joining the members of the advisory committee. And then, of course, we will open the floor to questions and answers. Now, I would have liked uh, to actually accept questions uh, after uh, each advisory committee uh, speaks, but in fact, because we're just going to have to draw up the conclusions, the person who's actually responsible for writing the conclusions needs to hear what they have to say as soon as possible. So we're just going to hear from each of them in turn, and then we'll take questions and answers for purely logistical reasons. So I'm going to follow the order that I have written down here on my piece of paper on the program. And the first person uh, who's going to speak is Daniel Inerarity. He is a professor, a professor of social and political science. Uh, he's an ICABAS professor at the University of the uh, Basque Country, and he is the director of governance. Good morning, everyone. Egunon, as we say here in the Basque Country. I'm just going to say a few things because I've only been given 15 minutes. And uh, obviously, there's not enough time to go into too much detail. But first of all, I would say that the Turkish Unirakis, in my opinion, uh, aims to respond to two of the main problems that we have today in our modern day society and political systems. One is more theoretical, the other is more practical. The theoretical problem has to do with the fact that we live in a society which is going at a very fast pace, in which political agendas are very, very, they, they change a lot. They ha Everything has to be uh, immediate. They're very reactive in nature. And this, I think we can say that we live in a society which is incredibly distracted by the present moment and that pays very little attention to the deeper rooted trends, which are sometimes more important than just the everyday waves and bumps that are on the surface. And the political agendas, and even among the normal population, the everyday population, there's a, a bit of a, a cognitive deficit. We don't really know what's happening. What's happening is what the newspaper says this morning. Is that what it is? Or is it the degree of uh, climate change that is happening little by little, almost without us noticing it? Which, what, what's more real, what the newspapers say or what's happening little by little without us noticing? And then, of course, all the crisis arrived and we all terribly surprised. We're not ready for them. Sometimes, uh, as a society, we're pretty stupid because we just aggregate a, a huge range of different behaviours and this aggregation of behaviours is actually harmful to ourselves when we could behave in a different way, uh, which would be less harmful. And to get out of this sort of, this sort of fatal uh, series of crises, just hopping from one crisis to another. How can we combat this? Well, thinking about things, we can strategize, we can you know, uh, look to the long term. That's the first idea. We also have a practical problem at the moment, and that is that we have to do things. 
And the things that we need to do now are very important. And the important things that we have to do have nothing to do, really, they're not in any way connected to changes that might happen in society just by pressing a button or just, you know, issuing a provincial law or just providing a medicine, or coming up with a new drug or just vaccinating people. Because this is a good example to illustrate what I'm trying to say about with a vaccine. We have more or less uh, achieved biological immunity, but now we actually need to get social immunity, which is something completely different. That's the challenge now. How to actually go through all these different transformations that will enable us to make sure that these things don't happen again. And if they do happen, uh, we are much better prepared to cope with them. And we say quite rightly as well, that a crisis like the climate crisis or the health crisis, the way out of these crises are closely linked to uh, carrying out social, very deep-rooted social transformations, the way in which we consume goods and services, mobility, how our relationship with nature, productive system, etc. But these are uh, transformations that a government alone can't bring about, especially even... Uh, uh, a government that has the vast majority of seats in Parliament. You can't do it because it's not something that could be done by governments. In the best case scenario, they would be achieved uh, thanks to the involvement and participation of all stakeholders and all members of society working in collaboration with other institutions and other spheres, etc., etc. So I'm going to give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. We can't cope with the climate crisis uh, with, for, with a vertical view of politics. We can't do that. It's not going to work. We can't just issue different laws and uh, establish uh, different uh, rules to what we have to reduce our emissions. Because you can't do that uh, unless you're actually counting on the support of people. And if you do that, we need to come up with some incentives to try to persuade people to actually change the way in which they move, they consume, etc. That can only be achieved with good information. It can only be achieved by convincing people and getting them to understand that the transformation has a price that needs to be paid. But we need to pay it because they are, it's a price that's going to be distributed fairly across all members of society. And this brings us to another question. How, as we say, we often say how. Okay, so uh, how, when we come out of the crisis, how do we go back to a new normal, which isn't a new normal, uh, which doesn't mean going back to the former status quo, but a normal that will take into account everything that we should have learned during this crisis. And then a third thing I wanted to say uh, has to do with a sort of a reserve that we need to have. We talk about uh, the crisis of uh, liberal democracy and representative democracy. And I would like to say that not all diagnoses of the crisis of representative liberal democracy that are carried out are better than the crisis itself. I mean, there are awful solutions that are being proposed. For example, uh, 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 unliberal democracies, populism, these are solutions to the crisis of liberal representative democracy. And they're no better than the crisis itself. And there are certain diagnoses which have been carried out of liberal democracy and representative democracy um, that have been carried out by the far right. And the solutions have been uh, um, proposed by the far right. And I don't think any of us would agree with that. I know that the, the leader of the Yellow Jackets, the French movement, the Yellow Jacket movement in France, the leader of that movement uh, said that they uh, were going to she support Sumur in the upcoming French elections. This is the leader. Uh, and I, I, I rang uh, a friend of mine in France and uh, my friend said, I asked him, well, what's going on? And he said, this isn't going to have a happy ending. And he explained to me that at the beginning of the Yellow Jacket movement, part of the French left uh, goes out and, and sort of, you know, uh, basically they went out and said, yeah, OK, you're right, because any time anyone protests, the left says that they're right. But what we're saying, that they're correct, that they've got a point. But now what's happening 
any protest like the protest in Glasgow, what we can see is a cacophony of different interests. I mean, in these protests, there are people who are criticising the results of the Glasgow meeting because they think it's too strict and there are some that think it's too uh, lax. And the same is happening with the yellow jackets. They were uh, protesting about increase in diesel prices uh, and they're protesting against something that needed to be done. I mean, one thing is to do it um, fairly, fair distribution, but it has to be done. So the universe of protest and criticism in that universe in that universe today, there's a huge cacophony. There's a huge range of different voices. And there are, in fact, sometimes even completely opposing interests. And politics can't shirk its responsibility. Uh, it's true that these changes won't happen without society, but these changes do need to be led by institutions who are going to make some kind of political commitment. So how can we talk about the legitimacy of this leadership? I mean, and what would that consist of? Because there would be no point having authoritarian leadership. I mean, that's simply, there's no room for that. We can't just impose things. So the only legitimacy, or the most important legitimacy that we can bestow on political leadership is trying to guarantee the equality of all citizens in uh, participation in public decision making. So that they have equal participation, fair participation in public decision making. Victor said this earlier in his keynote presentation. There are people who have more lobbying power, they have better education, they can handle uh, the online world better, they form part of different lobbies, and there's lobbies of all kinds, uh, all different interests are represented by lobbies. And the legitimacy of political intervention and political leadership consists of making this space equal, the space for deliberation. The per those who have more power, for whatever reason, because they have a greater purchasing power, they tend to participate more, they, they have a greater impact on government measures, but that needs to be they shouldn't have more power than people who are on the margins of society or people who are undocumented, for example. They have the same right to a healthy environment and a sustainable economy and a sustainable uh, pension system. They have the same right, so they need to be able to uh, uh, participate in that space. And leadership needs to represent those interests as well. So they need to balance, uh, balance uh, so that uh, those who have more power don't dominate the discourse. And then I'll just finish now with my last idea, which is a kind of mental experiment that I would like to propose for you. It's a little bit provocative, just to give you some food for thought, very briefly. If, I don't know, perhaps in five, ten years, maybe 20 years down the line, if when we sort of, you know, we explore our computers and we find a link that will take us back to this wonderful conference 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, and we just look at it again and we listen to it all again. Uh, what would we miss? What would be missing? What aren't we saying now? What uh, would our future selves say, we should have talked about that then if we'd done this 10 years ago, if we'd done it three years ago, then we wouldn't have to be talking about, I don't know, uh, maybe we're talking about uh, future pandemics. And it's not on our radar, right? I think Bill Gates uh, probably uh, thinks about it, but the rest of us don't. What is it that we would find missing? What would our future selves think we should be talking about? And uh, I haven't been in all of the different uh, panels because I still haven't worked out how to be in two places at the same time. It's a shame, but there we are. But I think we're not talking about technology and we should be talking about technology. Uh, all these algorithmic technologies, inter artificial intelligence, automatic systems, all of these things, we're not talking about them when we should be. I think that in 15 years' time, 5 years' time, 10 years' time, whatever, that will be these things, uh, I think, will, will feature on the list that we, our future selves could make of things we should have talked about today and yesterday. They were inappropriately absent, I think. And they are inappropriately absent from our discussion. We're in making an increasing number of decisions using automated systems, and that's great. 
uh, because we have very complex political decisions to make and it's difficult to make them without using systems of this kind. But these systems um, pose all sorts of different problems, bias, discrimination, uh, lack of justification, and they contradict a democratic principle, which is fairly basic, to a certain extent at least. We, we could uh, solve it, I think, if we wanted to, and that is the principle of self-determination. The fact that nobody can uh, substitute us as humans in our right to decide. So, uh, that's all from me. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much, Daniel. Los cambios no se hacen sin la sociedad, eh, pero... You were saying that changes need a society, and yet... Uh, Society also needs leadership uh, to be able to balance out all the vested interests and uh, contradictory interests. Once again, leadership uh, has been mentioned, just like yesterday. We will now be hearing from Diego Monuz, co-founder of Science and Innovation Link Office. And I just wanted to mention now something uh, technical. Um, the sound is a little bit echoey here, uh, listening to uh, Daniel in a rarity. I don't know if um, you had a, the same problem in the room. Could you hear Daniel properly? Oh, great. So it might just be us here. I'm glad. Is my mic working? Not just yet. Oh, great. It's being connected. Good morning, everyone. The challenge now is being here surrounded by academics, whereas uh, I'm a practitioner, as uh, English speakers say. That will be my angle. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what was discussed yesterday first, uh, and then a couple of ideas just quickly about we still need to cover during our session today. Yesterday we heard a little bit of background uh, for this fantastic, massive project um, and model Edorkisuna Eraikis. So today uh, we will continue to talk about governance, but not uh, the governance uh, about the past, but about uh, what is still to come. So we are talking about experimentation and innovation in public policies and policy making, and um, what the Provincial Council has done here in Kipuzkoa is quite unique, full of merit. And uh, one of the questions that were asked uh, to uh, the regional minister, can you imagine uh, what uh, people will say about the success of Edorkisunai Raikis in 10, 15 years' time? Well, that will totally depend on not just managing uh, collective and participatory initiatives, uh, but also on how the projects are actually implemented over time, uh, because uh, inter-institutional governance uh, will be required uh, for that to be successful. And I would like to mention a couple of ideas in this sense. The first one is entitled Napoleon Against Climate Change, and the second one is the multi-level toolkit. And uh, Victor Lapuente uh, mentioned uh, how in Europe uh, we are very much used uh, to cumbersome governments that where departments work in silos, where um, service uh, provision um, has a very complex structure, which uh, is has been inherited uh, partly from France, from Napoleon's administration, whereas uh, in other countries, in Europe, uh, there, there's uh, a lot more leeway to doing an 
undoing things uh, to different agencies uh, being managed by one department uh, at one point and by some other department further down the line. So, if we ask citizens about challenges uh, for Etorki Sunairaikis, logically they don't think about what department is going to be managing what. They think about their needs, aging, climate change, uh, whatever. And that's what I mean by Napoleon versus rather than against climate change. We will see later on more about future solutions, uh, but uh, at coffee break time, uh, talking uh, to the regional minister, we were saying that um, different departments uh, in uh, the provincial council have different powers and competencies, and uh, it's all very well to say on paper that a particular strategy uh, will be mainstreamed, um, whether it is uh, mobility or climate change or aging population. Um, it looks nice on paper, but uh, the different departments then need to decide who does what. So my first idea about governance uh, about this is the real challenge is not how we're going to be working uh, with uh, the Etorki Sunairaiki structure or the f new foundations, but rather how that all interacts uh, with the existing departments and their structures. And then the multi-level uh, toolkit, that's my second idea. I open my toolkit and you get different levels with uh, little compartments where I keep my mm, pliers, my screwdrivers and hammer, whatever. Well, let's imagine that each one of those uh, compartments are departments in a public institution. So when we ask a citizen about a challenge. Uh, they don't think about those compartments. Uh, everything is much more about uh, public services that are required uh, for a certain need and they don't care uh, who is going to provide them. But uh, talking to a public institution, uh, that's got an extra level of complexity and that's mo why multi-level governance and institutional collaboration is so important. And going back to our toolkit uh, with the compartments uh, for the various uh, departments in the provincial council, in a um, local council, uh, in the um, national government and so on. Each one of those compartments uh, have their areas they cover and their powers. And uh, what we can do is tidy up our toolbox, um, reorganize it, and then have certain tools uh, to better communicate and raise awareness and... Uh, foster public debate, uh, and that would be more across the board. And yet, uh, those uh, elements across the board are not going to be present at the same level in all the various compartments in my toolbox. For instance, working with Adin Berry, um, we can think, well, the provincial council in Gipuzkoa has established good channels uh, for communication and collaboration amongst the various compartments in the toolbox. Well, that might be the case, uh, but I'm sure the challenge uh, will still be there because uh, the council, the provincial council, is not the only public administration providing those services. There are other levels at a local level, a national level, and so on. And I think uh, collaboration amongst uh, those public institutions, amongst those levels, is part of uh, the key for success. And now is the time to do it. We uh, visited uh, Mubil, uh, the foundation, uh, together with the provincial, the president of the provincial council. 
They were telling us about the living lab, how they work with citizens, and that's the key, right? That's the secret for this to succeed. So that uh, every project and initiative has very clear in their minds uh, who has what tools in what compartment. If there is a project on silver economy, for instance, well, the Provincial Council will be providing part of those services, uh, but other services uh, will, will be provided by the local council or the regional Basque government. And this experimental uh, work that the Torquisuna Eraikis is doing, uh, for it to have a real impact uh, over time, uh, Part of the key to sec that success will be aligning all those different levels uh, in the reorganization of the toolkit compartment. That's a, a massive challenge for public policy experiments, particularly in the initial stages of a model uh, with the various pilot projects to guarantee real impact at the end of the day. I felt yesterday uh, it was kind of mentioned uh, how Etorquisuna Eraikis, for instance, works with a network of local councils, uh, which is uh, basic uh, for everybody to be accountable on the one hand and also uh, so that citizens will fall in love, shall we say, with uh, what the public institution is doing if that's done and everything is well aligned together with the governance uh, and the alignment of the ecosystem logically that's important too but i think the basic main challenge is better aligning the tools uh, in that toolkit with the various level levels of administration Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, later on, we will be hearing from representatives of the public of the Provincial Council. And thank you very much uh, for mentioning that ingredient, which uh, is often uh, on the tables when we talk about Etorquisuna Eraikis. Uh, collaborative governance uh, has to first and foremost uh, be implemented uh, indoors, uh, in-house. And uh, I'm, I know, I'm very much aware that uh, Etorquisunae Raikis uh, has been working on it and uh, they can tell us more about that a little bit later. We will now hear from Hilmer Giovanni Castro Nieto. Oh, you're so clever. Uh, you sat exactly uh, in the order, the right order. He's a, an associate professor at the Haverian uh, University in uh, public administration. He's a member of the Council on uh, Public uh, Learning in the Basque Country. I would like to start with a word of thanks uh, to the organizers, uh, to the Provincial Council in Gipuzkoa for inviting me to be here letting me part of this really important project, Etorquisuna Eraikis. I would like to start uh, with a comment about uh, the current situation. Since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic started almost 20, uh, two years ago, sorry, um, human history has a before and an after uh, the COVID pandemic. And that has uh, put a lot of pressure uh, for us to reprogram uh, that uh, model of public administration that focuses on people. And uh, I think Torquis Nairaikis is doing that fantastically well. We heard that yesterday. And uh, Victor this morning explained uh, why. Uh, social capital, changing society, improved society, uh, uh, an added value, uh, all of those are 
elements uh, that are very much present in the Etorkizuna Eraikis model and in their practical exper experiments. ICT is another important component. And um, it works only as a result of collaborative work. That's, uh, again, uh, fundamental. Uh, technologies are fundamental, but if we use them in that manner, the adoption of uh, technologies and globalization uh, have um, those processes have been accelerated uh, so hugely since the beginning of the pandemic uh, with all the impacts uh, that it's having on us. Uh, where it succeeds uh, to better connect us uh, and uh, to be able to bridge uh, the technological gap as well or divide. One point, point uh, that I think uh, is still to be uh, covered uh, more in depth by Etorki Sunairaikis is that before the COVID pandemic, we knew that we needed a, a common language for the human race to be united. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, it, the language, the common language, uh, has to do with technologies, with ICT, and uh, the younger generations know that perfectly well. So, whether we talk about governance, markets, or technologies, um, they uh, should all help uh, to change the way we acquire knowledge, the way we are uh, consuming resources, and so that uh, we can better understand uh, our reality uh, on the basis of critical factors or n elements of knowledge. I think that's where we still need to make a lot of progress. I think um, if we do so, uh, we will survive this le uh, leadership crisis uh, that uh, we are diagnosing in more and more areas worldwide. Yesterday, we heard about uh, how important it is for us to unlearn first before uh, we set to learning, which is uh, totally right. We need to first imagine what uh, that actually entails, what unlearning uh, is and uh, how to do so. And Victor uh, gave us a reminder of that today. He talked about uh, control and bureaucracy, the way it's being uh, implemented uh, in our organizations. Uh, in some areas more than others, uh, that uh, has changed over time. Uh, but uh, there are there's a lot of uh, reluctance, a lot of resistance to change. Uh, there are so many administrative processes and procedures where uh, there's still far too much control. So that's one of the unlearning uh, tasks new generations, the younger generations uh, are asking uh, very clearly for us to do so. And I think they've learned uh, the lesson where uh, they know now that uh, they need to unlearn certain things. We need uh, this loop of uh, continuous learning led by uh, entrepreneurship, that spirit uh, that uh, pushes us forward. In Etorkis Unairaikis, uh, the model uh, is about um, collaborative governance, uh, a model which is more and more present amongst um, organizations 
which uh, is totally uh, basic uh, for us to be able to uh, apply smart um, solutions. Entre los desafíos que debemos priorizar. I've got here a list of uh, challenges uh, that I feel are uh, priorities. Thinking how competition uh, has to do with global interdependence on the basis of compet uh, and changing from competitive advantage uh, to collaborative competition. Um, we often hear talk about globalization, and the Torquisona Eraikis uh, shows that very well. Uh, how uh, the local sphere um, can guide us uh, towards global outcomes. For instance, in the way um, public services are provided with better communication, on the basis of better communication. That's why I keep mentioning ICT. Making the most of them uh, to feed uh, our critical thinking, uh, which is not being overly critical or uh, with destructive criticism, but rather uh, setting uh, the direction towards a sustainable reality with uh, an organizational culture uh, that has uh, to do with internal ecosystems. Another challenge uh, is uh, for us to better understand and analyze a more intimate understanding of ethics and values and what um, sustainable growth of uh, socially responsible organizations mean. Uh, Victor mentioned uh, during his presentation something about this too. This uh, leadership style is necessary more than ever now. Uh, with uh, new professional standards, um, because it's nothing new, really. But uh, again, we need to rethink that uh, the demand for transparency is unstoppable. We see that uh, organizations uh, need to now develop uh, knowledge and uh, generate knowledge fast, swiftly, but uh, also proving that they do so transparently. Again, now more than ever before, at a time when public scrutiny uh, leaves no room whatsoever for um, cases of social uh, irresponsibility. We can't uh, avoid that reality any further. Organizations um, can't afford uh, to uh, put their reputation and credibility at stake. And uh, I'm also talking about um, well, I'm talking about uh, any type of organization, including uh, non-governmental organizations. Organizations uh, should also make their decisions uh, swiftly. Uh, speed matters and taking into account all the different um, elements in their context. The leadership, uh, leadership is important, very true, and uh, the leadership style uh, should also include collaboration. And Sonia um, knows a lot about this. There are new ways uh, for us to understand competition in a market uh, which is uh, where demand uh, is changing non-stop. a market uh, which is more and more systemic, 
which is why uh, we will have to find new solutions, solutions that we can't even imagine right now. I think the basic uh, key for Etorkis Unairaikis uh, to be so successful is your um, confidence. Uh, you are confident uh, that this is a successful model when uh, people like us come from a different environment uh, we are totally taken by your faith and your confidence entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship um, in your model uh, is evidence uh, for effective collaboration and that's uh, a basic key to your success Both global and local environments uh, are defining more and more uh, a consumer that uh, a consumption, sorry, uh, which is uh, different. A way uh, for consumers uh, to um, be more aware of the relevance of sustainability. Again, Etorkis Nairaikis is doing that very well. Artificial intelligence uh, that includes emotional intelligence, uh, that's required as well. Whether it's with technologies such as augmented reality or different uh, options, all of those were dilemmas uh, not so long ago. But uh, more and more, uh, they're helping in the uh, Uh, decision-making process, talking to Carlos Valencia, well, to a number of us, uh, Xavier Barandiaran, a number of the people who are now in the room. Mm, we've we've talked about uh, how uh, hard it is for us to adapt to this new re reality. Again, uh, I'm going back uh, to the idea of unlearning. And then last but not least, I would like to close uh, my short address to you all today with a reminder. Listening uh, to your presentations and learning about your model, Etorkisuna Eraikis shows uh, how this is a very different model that is working in Gipuzkoa. That's uh, a, a very relevant outcome because uh, you ha you have uh, practical experiences, uh, not many so mo so far, but uh, more and more as time time goes by. That's certainly one of our of your strengths and. Um, disseminating that, uh, letting people uh, all over the world know about uh, those experiences is so important. And that's why the connections uh, that uh, are being made with uh, consumers, suppliers, uh, leaders, managers, with the whole of society uh, is paramount. And it should be aligned uh, with objectives uh, that promote this new organizational culture. And I said new, as in uh, reviewed and improved uh, and adapted uh, to uh, this ever-changing society. Let's not forget uh, that diversity uh, should also be taken into account in everything we do. Connecting uh, with reality requires us to do so in this global world. In a world uh, where we heard yesterday morning during the keynote speech, um, the labor market, for instance, will be more and more diverse. A collaborative government uh, should also understand that their internal customers uh, are also changing quite significantly. 
what uh, the provincial council is doing uh, in house uh, is also uh, so important uh, in politics uh, people sometimes take for granted uh, that uh, their people their staff will follow no matter what well sometimes that's taking too much for granted unless we do things right era is a model where uh, it's a uh, practical work that matters most you're doing it right and to be honest uh, so many different uh, attempts uh, towards something similar have been done in around the world but uh, you've managed uh, to connect academia the private uh, sector public institutions um, citizens at large I think that can be your competitive edge this shared learning process I think is the most interesting element uh, for me in your model and I think that will be um, something for the world to learn from you because a collaborative governance uh, is geared towards society but also on the basis of an improved society which is uh, something that was mentioned again by our keynote speaker today Victor Let's continue then to stop uh, along the way and keep checking uh, how the future is looking, looking ahead and remembering that uh, uh, we need uh, meeting points uh, for this open innovation. Topagune, uh, I believe you say in the Basque language. We need meeting points uh, where we can stop and reflect and talk to other people about uh, a shared future. Well, that's uh, my uh, point of view so far uh, during the participation in your conference about um, outcomes about uh, what uh, can be improved and uh, I hope um, that's the case thank you very much you've uh, raised a number of different questions and uh, many of them are linked to how complex it is to build this intangible value which is social capital And this is particularly interesting to me because I know that, uh, and I know that everyone working in Turkish uh, Unirakis has thought about it a lot, this difficult tension between trusting the model but at the same time being open to change. Not uh, being, not allowing yourself to get carried away by prescriptive strategies but be open to new emerging strategies and uh, being willing to unlearn in order to learn more and uh, trust and to trust in the model at the same time. This is a very difficult uh, tension. It's a very difficult balance to strike and it's interesting to see, uh, in fact, it will be interesting to see how the people involved in Etorquez um, uh, cope with it. Now we have Mireya Zubelia here with us who is the leader or the director of the Site Business School at the University of Oxford. The floor is yours, Maria. Thank you very much, Mari Jose. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would just like to apologize for my cough. I know that now, uh, you know, uh, if someone coughs, everyone sort of runs out screaming, but please rest assured I have uh, had five PCR tests in the last month and I do not have COVID-19, so don't worry but I do have a cough, unfortunately. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate all the speakers for their presentations yesterday. They were very concise, straight to the point and very interesting. When I was listening to all of you, uh, I thought, oh, I just remembered all of these different panels that I tend to attend uh, with uh, entrepreneurs 
uh, I'm a I'm a tutor in a project which focuses on, uh, on entrepreneurship, and uh, my students have to make, give presentations at the end of the project. And when I was listening to you, I was just formulating different press questions that I think be interesting to ask you. For example, what problems are you solving? What needs are you meeting? What's your value proposal? Uh, why is it different from the one that exists already? Can it be scalable? Can it be grown? How are you going to fund it? Not just now, but in the long term. What objectives or what landmarks are you aiming to achieve? How are you going to anticipate what's going to happen? And how are you going to anticipate occurrences of the next few years in order to establish your goals? And then finally, the team, which is always the most important thing. Who's behind all of this and how do they interact? This is a very, very important part of any government structure. And these are questions that we should always be asking ourselves. With regard to the challenges that you uh, were talking about, I'd like to focus on three. First of all, internationalisation. Now, as you all know, a fairly easy and direct way uh, to become more international is by participating in European projects. I've worked in European projects in the past and I think they there are a bit of a double-edged sword because they help you gain references. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, the strategies are aligned though and you need to make sure that they do actually contribute value to your own process, that they're complementary. It should be one plus one makes three, uh, not actually taking away from your project and having projects that are completely different. And the collaboration needs to be true collaboration. And in order to achieve all of this, it's really important to carry out active foresight uh, when you are searching for partners. And you have to be very ambitious as well. And this means that there is a true meshing of gears between projects, which gives rise to true uh, learning rather than just different partners working together and not really getting anything out of it. Secondly, you talked about this complex uh, context with different interests, different agendas, and the fact that we need to overcome a certain amount of mistrust, especially at the beginning. I also think uh, that there was a lot, I sort of drew a lot of parallels with my experience in companies. Because when you want to launch an innovation process, uh, you generally have a cross-cutting um, team of people from different areas, uh, each with their own goals and aims. And how do you integrate all of this different, uh, these different goals, these different interests to make it competitive, to make it work? Well, one way is by using uh, cross-cutting innovation methodologies or transversal innovation methodologies. Uh, and then we can also, un this helps you unify the work in the interests of all of those involved. And then in relation to the third challenge that was mentioned, which is again very important, and that is the role of leaders, the leadership role, uh, as opposed to the role of facilitator of the process, trying to make sure that the whole initiative is a success. Years ago, I set up a, uh, a network of technological companies in Navarre, involving many different companies and universities. And you shouldn't underestimate how difficult it is to actually do that and the frustration that uh, is entailed when you're trying to uh, manage a network of this kind, because uh, it's difficult to get them to see you as just another uh, partner and not the person with the great big bag of money that's going to finance and fund all their projects. And it, it's difficult to overcome this barrier. There are a number of different ideas that we can value to overcome this. Transparency from the beginning would be one way. And then a very clear expectation management. We have to manage expectations. And then we have the max funding um, mechanism as well in which you um, you you contribute so much, but uh, the partners also have to contribute. So it's not free for them. And then your role needs to have a multiplying effect, needs to have a cascade effect. And in order to overcome these three challenges, 
I think the best way is to systematize the innovation processes in the different activities. And there are two main steps that need to be made, that need to be taken, sorry. At the beginning, it's very important to establish the focus of innovation, the strategy that we want to come up with, not just the um, challenge, but also the goal. And it's important to do that with the leaders so that we get full commitment from the leaders. And we also need to make sure that all, this is, all the partners buy in to the uh, projects and initiatives right from the beginning, because there's a lot often you have to manage a lot of egos and everyone wants to just continue and to develop my idea, my idea. But it's not just your idea, it's everybody's idea. It's a shared idea. But they do need to feel uh, that they own the idea. They need to buy in to the idea. And in this focus of innovation, also the rules of the game are established. So there are clear expectations, you're managing expectations and you're being transparent. And the teams are set up as well. And just like in any innovation process, it's very important for there to be two groups, a larger group and then like a core group that will be participating in all the activities. Because in the larger group, we have the people who actually make the decisions. And in the core group, we have the people who are actually going to be managing the process from an operational point of view. Uh, but in fact, when you're making key decisions, you include the members of the larger group. So you have a greater degree of buy-in. And then, in fact, you can assess what ideas are going to be and decide what ideas are going to be implemented and what ideas are going to be put in the fridge for a little while and maybe used in the future. And this is the first part, which would be the focus of innovation. And the second step would be implementing these design thinking processes or innovation sprints or whatever process you decide to use yeah, in parallel so that you can resolve specific problems in all the different areas that you're managing. As you all know, I think that you've done that very, part very well here in Gipuzkoa. Uh, uh, the five phases of design thinking are empathize, uh, design, implement, etc., test and uh, retest. But empathize is very, very important. The empathizing uh, step is a, a crucial step because you need to get everybody on the same page at the very beginning. And then just to finish, I would just like to offer you a series of more general thoughts. Firstly, high tech companies, in high tech companies, I always perceive a certain degree of negativity. But I would like to highlight that they do play an important role. No, it's not such an economic role. It's a role to transform society. They help society change in order to rise to major challenges. They can be drivers for change. I think um, one example of this is the, uh, is the vaccine. I, was, uh, I, I met the, a few weeks ago with uh, the person who developed the vaccine in Oxford. And she said, well, that's fine. We have the vaccine and we made it available to society. Now, there are a lot of rumours, I know, uh, about uh, other manufacturers and how they were making a profit and Oxford wasn't. And people were saying, well, it's probably because it's not as effective or whatever. But uh, Sarah Gilbert, the woman who developed the vaccine, uh, said it no it was just that we wanted to put it make it available to society so the role of high-tech companies is very important another driving force is the fact that it's important to support the innovation efforts or of more vulnerable vulnerable groups uh, marginalized groups this is really important this is a cornerstone uh, of what you are trying to build here you need to support the innovation efforts of the uh, of those social groups in less favorable situations. And then we can talk about measurements, KPIs, uh, in the indicators. Well, I think it's quite motivational, it's quite inspirational to say like, look, I'm going to really go for it. What do I want to achieve? But then you need to find out uh, ways of comparing your current situation with your past situation. Even though you're building a very uncertain future, it's always a good idea and it's always very positive to have some kind of benchmark uh, through which to measure your progress. And then the user focused approach and to use participants uh, and f end users in all the different steps. You need to put users center stage, a user centered approach. And this uh, is based on the customer journey sometimes, which is basing, uh, basing what you do on uh, and everything that you learn 
on that experience. And I think this is something that we need to do as well. It's a very important idea. And then for an innovation to be successful, it's really important to have the buy-in of the key stakeholders in the innovation ecosystem right from the very beginning. Because that's the only way of actually generating true buy-in. Now, I don't know if I should say this in a panel about governance, but chaos is actually quite positive. It's quite positive for innovation. I mean, obviously, controlled chaos. And Oxford, we have a completely uncontrolled chaos, and that's not great. And I always use the example of the structure of the university itself, which has always been very innovative right from the very beginning. There's 45 different colleges. Each of these colleges have its independent governance structure, but all of them work to foster a connection and diversity between different disciplines. You can be studying in a, one college, uh, studying I don't know, medicine, and then next to you could be somebody who's uh, studying engineering, and then next door could be someone who's studying humanities. Yeah, so this cross-cutting nature, this diversity is very, very important. It's fostered right from the very beginning at Oxford. And with this, what am I trying to say? Well, if everything worked perfectly with that uh, system of government, if it works there, well, then anything is possible, right? Because it's a very chaotic situation. And then uh, somebody once said that the best way of predicting the future is to create it. So good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for all these very practical, the practical uh, tips. I know I can see lots of people who are jotting things down here because uh, they're very practical, very useful tips, uh, ways of actually generating the trust that is necessary, that's necessary to uh, create uh, everything that we're trying to create. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if the next time there was an event about a Turkisune Reikis, I don't know, perhaps the, uh, the slogan perhaps will be chaos is good. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that that was the slogan of the next conference. Now we're going to hear from Sonia or Spina. She works at the Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Now, I know that Sonia is making a really big effort to actually pronounce Etorkisune Reikis properly, which is no easy task. So uh, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it, Sonia. We all know what you're talking about, but don't worry too much. It's a difficult term to pronounce. Well, first of all, um, I, would, uh, I would like to ask, I would like to apologize if what I'm going to say is something that you are already doing, because um, I have basically just based my recommendations and my presentation on what I heard yesterday. But if what I'm saying is too obvious and things that you're already doing, then it's only because I don't know as much as I should know about what you're doing, because I'm just basing my comments on what I've heard over the last two days. Now, uh, I think that's the only time I'm going to say it properly, but I did say it properly that time as well. There are many things that are positive about Etorkisuneireikis. And they come up, uh, and in fact, uh, we, there are certain concerns, but uh, I'd like to offer a series of recommendations. The first one has to do with the coherence of the logic of the initiative. Because I think it's very clear, it has an impeccable logic, it's very well founded, wonderfully grounded, it's very robust. The coherence of the narrative about the initiative is strong, it's convincing. It's also important to highlight that its managers highlight themselves the importance of this co consistency, this coherence, with the Gipuzkoa model. I got Gipuzkoa wrong. It's difficult for me to say Gipuzkoa as well, uh, in the sense that uh, they are working to improve the rich collaborative tradition that exists in the province. The initiative is defined as a systemic response to the challenges which are posed by uncertainty, complexity, instability. This is just a mini, mini uh, uh, summing up uh, all of this, these challenges posed by the current crisis, loss of trust by citizens, uh, public institutions which are unable to actually rise to challenges by themselves. And the response uh, includes two parallel aspirations. So institutions need to open up to citizens and citizens need to trust in them 
uh, to come up with uh, solutions and to work with them in order to make a different sort of collaborative government. Now, these aspirations require the construction of social capital and trust in different areas in order to make the most of the collaborative and participatory tradition, which has always been a hallmark of the Basque community. So this is all well and good, but I have two concerns. The first one has to do with citizens. In no document, and I haven't heard in any of the presentations, a specific definition about what a citizen is. Who exactly are you talking to? What sort of citizen? I know you want to include representatives from different groups, but who are these people exactly? Citizen is a very general term, which really isn't very useful. So I'm asking these questions. I don't expect an answer now. I'm just trying to explain my concerns. So have you actually analysed the different types of citizen that you want to include? Who are these thousands of citizens that have participated? What are their characteristics? Who do they represent? And what do their attributes tell us about the different types of participatory mechanisms that are being used? Have you systematically studied what the priorities should be? Uh, given the limited resources available, where are the deepest gaps in mistrust in the province? Where is it more strategic or best? Where do we need to weave and to create social capital? Where is it most needed? Have we studied different types of citizens in a different way? And what social identity do you want to give priority to? What different socioeconomic levels do you want to give priority to? And finally, have you done anything to actually attract those citizens that are, who are more difficult to attract? Or are you just happy to attract any citizens? Uh, because you basically will be talking to those who are already involved, right? Now, I'm sure you've already asked yourselves these questions, but I haven't found any evidence of the answers anywhere. So my first recommendation would be, if there are responses to these uh, concerns, then you should articulate them specifically in these documents that you are disseminating. If you haven't been considering these issues systematically because you've been so busy doing everything else, I mean, that's perfectly understandable, but perhaps now would be the time to do it, given the stability that the initiative has acquired after these five years of hard work. The second concern has to do, uh, it is a very specific concern, but given the power of language to construct narratives, I think it's very important. In the panel I heard and in the documents I read, words about the idea of re-establishing the public conditions in order to deepen our democratic model and to construct democracy in the uh, current context. The word reconstruct or re-establish looks to the past, not to the future. So my second recommendation would be that since the, the change of mindsets uh, in a, force us to come up with a new language, a language of the future, I would, like, I would suggest that you uh, substitute uh, the word re-establish and use instead re-imagine. So we don't want to go back to the democracy that has been lost. We want to reimagine it. We want to dream once again. We want to come up with a new meaning for a new time. Now, the second dimension that I focused on has to do with the architecture of the initiative. This architecture is, at first glance, uh, clear and concise. Two spaces for listening and experimentation with three cross-cutting areas, which has to do with um, internationalization and uh, experimentation, socialization and communication, complemented by nine reference centers, which are specializing in emerging topics. All of this geared towards improving public policies through a new way of governing open collaborative governance which connects the public administration with different social, economic and political stakeholders in the province. But when you start to describe the dynamics of these eight elements which make up this architecture, we find something that's a, a much more complex. It's very difficult to actually manage this very complex reality and to socialise it. The initiative is a complex system 
which uh, generates uh, relatively autonomous uh, and equally complex subsystems. And in these subsystems, they foster and manage many different uh, stakeholder networks and semi-permanent networks of uh, uh, service providers and services themselves. It's basically an architecture which is polycentric and it's a, a means of trying to govern through networks. Now, one, uh, I think that the uh, systematic way in which the initiative has been developed has been highlighted as one of its main, uh, its main strengths. And having this portfolio is very important when you can see the connections between the different initiatives. Uh, just not going from the metaphor of the tree, but actually spreading that out to include the metaphor of the forest. There are a lot of connections, and that is true between the different centers and the different networks so that the whole thing can be scalable and each subset system can feed and nurture the system uh, as a whole. But it is difficult to actually maintain this systemic vision in a permanent way and to actually monitor all the different projects and to establish connections between the different elements. And that is, in fact, one of the challenges that you have identified in the case of Gipuzkoa Lab, for example, and the different uh, multiple projects that have been carried out at the different uh, reference centers. And I'm sure that this is going to also be a challenge for Gipuzkoa Taldea with its seven projects. So it's a complex architecture. In which is what is, is necessary because the uh, problem is also complex. But it's difficult to manage, uh, not just the whole initiative in general, but each one of its separate parts as well. And so this generates the following concerns in my mind. First of all, what does a systemic vision mean in this context of emerging and changing networks? What theories are you using? The living systems theory or complexity theory or chaos theory? Do these theories, are they... They work, can they help you to work and, and experiment with this systemic view? And here, uh, the concept of paradox is very important here. Understand how these complexities always uh, end up in demands that maybe be pulling in separate directions. And rather than just choosing one or the other, perhaps we need to choose both of them and find ways that will bring them together. Uh, it, maybe you can get there through a much more indirect way, but they're very important, these sort of deviations, in order to include everything. More questions. In what uh, elements of these architecture is uh, where is the responsibility for maintaining the systemic view? Where is it located? And to accompany these networks in their learning process. What's the role of research in all of this? Also, in relation to the processes of support, what does manage mean in this context? Are you talking about traditional management of uh, human resources and financial resources? Or are you talking about a new way of managing networks in all the different cases in which they emerge? We know that the management of personal networks and inter-organization in networks uh, have their own dynamics. This management has its own dynamics, and it's not the same as managing an organization. It's very different. You need to have different skills, a different skill set, or skill sets that include the ones that you usually do, but actually include other ones as well. If this is a learning experience that happens in practice, how is it being systematized? And where are we having this exchange of lessons learned with regard to managing networks so that that can benefit the entire system? So my third recommendation is to uh, make the most of cutting edge technology and to use that to actually enable networks to share their learnings more. Because it's wonderful uh, in theory, but sometimes there are blind spots in practice. This isn't, I'm not proposing this as an academic task, actually, but actually as part of a practical activities and as a practical exchange of lessons learned and experiences, all based in different theories and this can actually serve as an opportunity for learning and co-production and to articulate new knowledge. This could be an area of knowledge which the initiative could lead and it could shed a lot of light on many issues. The third dimension that I studied was the conception and the nature of the leadership of the initiative. 
in the presentation. We were talking about strong, clear institutional leadership, permanent and long lasting in time. This is an initiative which has been uh, created by the Provincial Council and uh, it has the resources required. This is an enormous strong point for the initiative and in fact it's perhaps the thing that makes it feasible. Institutional leadership, however, is only one facet and it should be complemented uh, by explicit efforts to promote and support emerging leaderships in the different networks so that there is also bottom-up leadership as well as top-down leadership. You also talked about the need for a cultural change in citizens and in among the civil service. The idea is to try to change mindsets and working styles and also the narratives which support them, which are no longer uh, reasonable or useful when what we're trying to do is to foster collective work. So it's a vision of collective leadership to bring about social change. But what does that mean in practice? Because this vision of leadership has clear implications for everyday practice and general strategy as well. And they're very, very different. They will be different from the ones that will emerge when you're using more traditional leadership. The formal leadership of the initiative, which is based on the authority bestowed on the government by citizens, is different in different collaborative governance contexts. And one of these key functions is to aim to generate different spaces in which citizens can feel that they are doing something useful and be engaging in a common project. It's not a case of convincing other people, but rather to develop a leadership role in which the group together can find the right direction, can align their interests and can come up with the necessary commitment to move forward despite all difficulties, the difficulties that have been mentioned time and time again by the different panel members. This is called DAC. Direction, Alignment, Commitment. Three results that when they occur together represent the manifestation of collective leadership in practice. So Institutional, the institutional leadership that we talk about aims to generate leadership with all participants so that all participants can, a participant from their sphere of influence, whatever part of the system they are working in, in order to make sure that there is an alignment for the system as a whole. That will be how uh, we will have a structure that's organized around the networks and collaboration a different way uh, to organize matters, but uh, working with top-down leadership um, is uh, a different scenario. And I wonder, what are you doing uh, to have this common leadership at all levels and so that uh, networks uh, can also include uh, civil servants that are involved? Uh, are you uh, trying to have a uh, self-efficacy and collective e efficacy amongst leadership, amongst citizens, sorry, so that they can also lead the leaders. Have you looked at the different nodes, uh, the various reference centers to make sure that uh, there's good communication amongst them? What kind of accountability system do you have so that shared leadership doesn't end up with gray areas, but rather a uh, present new leadership uh, opportunities. I, all of this is connected with what I said about systemic vision so that uh, we can have uh, make the most uh, for research and action research connected uh, also with lessons learned from your um, projects uh, so that uh, there's also leadership that's bottom up all of my recommendations to put together um, can be uh, summarized uh, by recommending uh, using uh, indicators, both qualitative and quantitative, so that uh, you can measure your initiatives uh, and so that the various components can be uh, monitored uh, and so that uh, you can uh, also learn from that cascade effect over time. 
I also I would also like to leave uh, just uh, an idea, uh, systemic vision and. Uh, this uh, model of leadership um, make me wonder what uh, power means uh, for your model and shared power in particular that's been mentioned uh, during some of the presentations. I think uh, this is a very complex matter uh, that I'm not go going to go into detail for. And now uh, a little bit of a brainstorming session. Uh, is, which is not uh, a full list, uh, but just uh, a list of why I appreciate and admire so much your effort, which is much more complete than any other that I've heard about in public administration. You should celebrate the passion of those uh, who participate and uh, put all their will in this initiative, which is a genuine effort uh, made by civil servants in the Provincial Council. That's a huge success. The relevance of um, experimentation and action research and the courage and audacity uh, to take risks uh, to learn from having a wider range of uh, research initiatives uh, to be able to uh, learn from action research. Also, the fact that you've managed uh, to engage uh, the different uh, political parties, uh, all of them taking part in the initiative. All your hard work and perseverance uh, for five years, uh, learning uh, from your journey uh, is the only way to manage uh, networks well. And last but not least, collaborative governance as one of the four uh, strategies uh, that uh, you are debating. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you uh, for your very comprehensive and very uh, detailed uh, comments about the Etorkisuna Eraikis model. Many of these uh, issues, uh, I know, um, have been debated and analyzed uh, by uh, the practitioners, uh, but you're right, uh, it's a good list of challenges for the future. Later on, we will hear from uh, representatives on behalf of uh, Etorkis Unairaikis. But listening to you, I was thinking that yesterday uh, you accepted a, a proposal I made. I was asking you, what would you recommend if somebody uh, was interested in the Etorkis Unairaikis model? What would you tell them, uh, I wouldn't do this particular thing, uh, no matter what. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this particular element because of uh, my experience. That was my request. And um, we also said yesterday how uh, the advisory committee uh, is particularly rich uh, because you have so many different points of view and uh, backgrounds and listening to you today, I was thinking, uh, wow, uh, how uh, enriching, how complex as well because of all the various perspectives and angles involved. And if you allow me, uh, I would like uh, to now hear from this new element, this new member of the committee, improvised member. Uh, we want to hear from Telmo on behalf of uh, the younger generations. I want to thank you, Telmo, for uh, accepting our invitation. And sorry, I don't know your surname. Well, first of all, uh, I, this is totally unplanned. Uh, I wasn't meant to be here. But uh, you gave me the opportunity to say something on behalf of uh, the younger people and uh, not as an expert, because I'm not an, an expert in anything, but I can tell you my opinion. Let me give you a little bit of context. Why do I know about Etorkisuna Eraikis? I finished my degree course uh, one and a half years ago, and I was doing uh, my practical work during university uh, in a company that was involved in Etorkisuna Eraikis. And I was working there until April last year. 
they asked me uh, to stay. They wanted me to stay, but uh, I felt uh, it wasn't uh, the right time for me to do so. And at that time, I remember I was talking uh, to some former colleagues uh, from university, uh, thinking about our future, uh, and we decided to set up a, a, co a cooperative, uh, thinking about our generation about the Z generation. I I totally think Edorkis Unairaikis is an amazing uh, initiative. And uh, well, that's the background, and that's why I put my hand up yesterday to uh, ask a question yesterday, uh, thinking about us, uh, the youth. So thank you again for letting me be here uh, to give you my opinion. My first comment is that if I hadn't been in touch uh, working uh, for this company uh, that was involved in Torquis Unairaikis, I wouldn't have known about it. Uh, people, young people around me know nothing about it, about this amazing project. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the initiative uh, thinks about us, young people, but uh, we don't know about it. Uh, most of us don't. So it's a, a terrible waste. I think uh, it's an opportunity uh, that uh, shouldn't be wasted. Uh, we are a generation that's uh, politically uh, involved and engaged and interested in politics in general. So uh, I think uh, somebody should m make the most of that. So. Uh, the uh, million dollar question uh, is why why does this happen i think basically we are not we don't speak the same language and i understand um, getting people uh, interested and uh, engaged and 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 getting people to vote no matter what age uh, you are is not a simple task but again uh, i think uh, politicians in general are don't speak the same language as we do and uh, you might be talking about really interesting uh, matters for instance i still live with my parents because i i can't afford to move out and uh, this is quite a general uh, problem uh, Many young people can't afford uh, to uh, become independent. We, we're interested in politics, or we should be, uh, but we feel we don't have a voice. On the one hand, um, and then we don't hear about um, possibilities and places for us uh, to voice our opinion. That's why uh, the youth uh, often uh, don't trust uh, anything that has to do with pol with politics. It's uh, a terrible waste. A Torquis is is about building the future. Uh, so we are the future. We uh, we should be involved. A, a generation like mine uh, that is finding real problems uh, in basic matters uh, like uh, living independently or finding a job. Uh, we, we have a lot uh, to gain if uh, we are uh, political. And uh, you might think, oh, we, we, are, we have our profile on Instagram, so uh, that's how I communicate with people. That's, that's not enough. Uh, sometimes uh, the way we speak uh, has nothing to do with words. It, it might have to do with images, with pictures, and you're not doing it. I don't feel uh, any political uh, parties or any politicians speak my language when I listen to them. I was thinking how, round about one year ago, the City Council of Malaga, down south, designed uh, the uh, perfect neighbourhood uh, for the future of the city. And it was co-designed uh, with young people. I think that's a great example. I think politics uh, can be fun for us. And I, I don't think uh, there's this disaffection because we are not 
keen or we're not interested. It's just that the game uh, has rules that uh, are not interesting for us. Again, we're talking about building the future, and I, I'm not saying that uh, it should be us, young people, um, designing everything. It's, uh, it's not a black or white um, choice. It's not uh, just older people making the decisions or just younger people making the decisions. Uh, the initiative has to do with governance and uh, social services, public services, uh, which is very necessary. But sometimes uh, uh, we need that special spark, that uh, touch of naivety uh, and the right language uh, to connect with us. Plus, uh, giving us room and opportunity for us to participate. And if you do so, you will find a, a lot of young people uh, who will, if you find the right way. I modestly offer uh, to give you a hand. Um, and not because I want to look special or... Uh, but uh, it's such a massive opportunity because is, is is an amazing project. It's great. But again, uh, I only heard about it uh, because of sheer chance. Um, nobody uh, told me about it, for instance, when I was a university student. You were talking about uh, technologies and ICT and uh, uh, you have laboratories on mobility and cyber security. All these uh, uh, really interesting uh, technologies that young people uh, would be keen on. I was thinking about uh, people who are now studying engineering at university, for instance. Well, uh, the closer they are and the more they learn about all these emerging technologies, uh, the better chances they will have for the future. And I can tell you about friends of mine uh, who studied biomedical engineering and uh, they know nothing about these uh, wonderful companies uh, in Donostia. Uh, one of them had to emigrate to the U.S. Uh, because uh, he couldn't find a job here or nearby. Another one is in Barcelona. It's uh, a terrible waste, uh, all this brain drain. And again, uh, I'm not saying that uh, the youth um, are the saviors of the world. Not at all. But uh, sometimes uh, some freshness and crazy ideas that we could contribute uh, might uh, be important, an important contribution. Again, uh, I just want to uh, end uh, my, my address uh, with a word of thanks. Thank you for giving me a voice. And uh, let's hope that uh, by working together, we will make the future brighter. Bueno, muchas gracias, Telmo. Thank you so much, Telmo. It's great uh, having you here uh, to say that Etorquisuna uh, Eraikis um, works uh, with topics uh, that uh, are really important for young people uh, and uh, topics that you really care about. And it might just be a, a case of a language barrier and um, having opportunities uh, for you to participate. Great. Now, uh, with the light on, I can see you a lot better. I'm uh, a little bit confused at the moment because uh, we have a, a lot of ideas and tasks on the table. So, uh, and uh, we're short of time. So my big doubt uh, is who should we hear from next? 
Maybe I can leave it uh, for you to decide. Just raise your hand and uh, I would beg you to please, uh, if, if it's a question or a comment, uh, to um, make them as brief as possible. Congratulations uh, for this wonderful Etorkisuna uh, Eraikis Congress. Uh, I come from Bilbao and I'm so jealous of what you're doing here. And uh, well done uh, to Maria Jose, the chair, uh, for inviting Telmo to be here. I thought, ah, they're pretending uh, this is uh, co totally improvised. It can't be. No, honestly, I I'd never met Telmo before. I didn't know about him. Well, I was thinking that uh, We are talking about the model, how it should be also uh, bottom-up, um, about uh, integration of young people, for instance, governance, all these different uh, topics. And uh, I've not heard uh, anybody mention migration. I was talking to the mayor of the town of Ordizia, and I asked him, uh, what is the percentage of migrants uh, you have now? And uh, he couldn't tell me. Um, In uh, most towns, we're talking about around about 20% uh, migration right now, citizens. So, uh, we have all these wonderful people uh, coming to live here. Uh, they have uh, so much to offer. Uh, they, uh, they are a larger and larger share of our population. And uh, when I talk to people uh, who work in the third se sector, uh, they, they often don't know very much about it because uh, they have no channels uh, to communicate to them and, and talk to them and learn from them. Sometimes uh, because of bureaucracy, because of rigid structures. And I know uh, how we have uh, I call them tribes, uh, because they're almost like tribes uh, that are blind spots uh, in Basque society. Uh, groups of people who self-organize, who have very little contact with anybody else. And uh, uh, I often think that's uh, wasted potential. Uh, and I very rarely hear talk about them uh, unless it's uh, talk about subsidies, for instance. Thank you. We will hear from uh, somebody on Etorkisuna Eraikis. And can I just ask you, because I think uh, some of the panels, some of the other panels uh, finished a little bit later. Uh, do we really need to finish by one o'clock sharp? All right. Uh, they're telling me, yes, we need to be super on time. In that case, uh, we will be uh, hearing uh, from more of you who have questions or comments, and, and then we will have some answers from Etorkis and Iraikis representatives. I think there's one more question over there. Just a very quickly, uh, first of all, congratulations. I'm thinking that because Daniel in Edarity uh, is sitting next to Telmo, I was thinking that uh, I think the will is there. Um, I think public institutions do want to listen uh, to their younger to younger citizens. And uh, uh, after listening to Delmo, you're right. Uh, I think the trick is uh, reaching out to them with all these topics that they are interested in, uh, but doing it in the right style uh, is the how that matters. Thank you. Questions or comments from the floor? I can't see properly because the, shine, uh, the light is shining on us here on the stage. Name. Sí, allí. Ah, no. Estabas levantando la mano. No. Vale. <laughs> De acuerdo. Eh, sí. Ahí. I think there's one more question there. Sí, sí. Sí. Ayer comentas. 
when we heard yesterday the presentations on Etorkis and Airaikis, uh, they were telling us that uh, there are experimental projects on the one hand, and also there's work to better adjust public solici- policies. And Diego was talking about the different compartments uh, in the toolkit or toolbox. I think uh, adjusting uh, policies uh, properly, uh, particularly uh, for those tools uh, that might n- need to be mainstreamed and used uh, in different compartments, I think that would be a key for their success. Right. The multi-level idea, once again, and uh, working across the board. We only have about five minutes left. So can we now hear uh, from uh, those of you who are here on behalf on Etorkisuna Eraikis? Um, Either, maybe you can start. Uh, I often uh, find it hard uh, to be uh, brief, but I'll do my best. First of all, thank you uh, for listening to the positive uh, feedback. Uh, I I, I felt like crying, uh, and then I was taking a lot of notes uh, on um, critical aspects. We've heard a lot about citizens and participation, and that's definitely uh, one of our main concerns. And when we launch uh, a participation process, we find that uh, it tends to be the same type of people who take part. Uh, We've been working with universities, for instance, uh, and activities with them, and it was uh, really surprising. Uh, When we got there, uh, we found uh, university students uh, who didn't look interested at all. Sorry, that that was our expectation. Uh, But we were totally wrong. Uh, They were so active. uh, They were really interested because uh, they wanted to uh, know and tell us about housing and uh, employment and uh, all these different uh, topics. We are going to set up the open uh, school project in Gipuzkoa with the aim uh, to uh, empower people and raise awareness uh, about uh, how their participation uh, is key uh, to policy making. I've got uh, many, many more notes uh, that I've been taking down. But uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your constructive criticism. And uh, I think that's probably enough from me because we're very short of time. Right, let's continue uh, hearing from more of you at the Council. And Diego, uh, you were saying that uh, uh, drafting uh, a paper or having a discourse that can reach to everybody, reach out to everybody. And I was thinking about this conversation I had with members of my family, and uh, um, we were talking about the millennials and how they view technology. And the younger members of the family uh, kind of disagreed. They they were saying, that's not what I do. And, And my mom said, no, no, no. Uh, you're, you're saying it all wrong uh, because um, those people at the end of a table are millennials, uh, but we over here are part of the Z generation. Well, uh, we're talking about diversity, uh, so when we talk about young people, they're not a group. I mean, they, they have very, very clear divisions and uh, differences amongst them too, and it's great uh, that you want to learn about that. Sebastian Surutuza, next. I would also uh, like to uh, thank you all.
for the effort uh, that you've made in the committee uh, to understand what we're doing, uh, to analyse what we're doing, and uh, we will, I'm sure, make the most of all those comments uh, or the feedback uh, that you've given us, members of the advisory committee and Telmo too. Yesterday I mentioned uh, as an element uh, institutional leadership, uh, but then the other side of that coin was uh, activating our community. Um, we totally feel that uh, we want collective leadership uh, for social change to be possible. I think that's definitely our brand. And uh, when you asked yesterday, uh, what uh, would you think success would look like for you in 15 years' time? Well, um, I think the various elements of our system uh, should prove and will hopefully prove that this is a collective benefit uh, for the whole of our territory. That's my dream come true in 15 years' time. I've also uh, been taking notes on what you've all been saying during the panel session. And I was thinking how Etorkis on uh, is a project uh, that's uh, been launched uh, by a public institution which has uh, both its pros and cons. And one of the cons is that uh, we need to make an effort uh, to uh, involve and engage other stakeholders and overcome uh, cultural um, barriers uh, for that to be the case and uh, promoting changes uh, for that to be possible. Sometimes that only works in the long term. I was also thinking about some of your comments uh, on our weaknesses and I was I, I had one of my slides um, with a list of elements on our portfolio um, with um, elements that uh, have been added over time, not in a very stru structured manner. Uh, it was more as they came up. We got going, and um, when an idea was uh, approved, uh, we just went ahead with it. And Giovanni, I, I, I totally agree with uh, your idea about unlearning, how important that is. And Maria, uh, what you were saying about sharing, absolutely. The projects and actions uh, in Edorkis on uh, have had uh, a difficulty because uh, our aim uh, was uh, improving equality in our society at all levels. We've been active, uh, adding projects, but uh, the systemic approach is something that uh, we've learned uh, later down the line. Uh, not We didn't have it uh, since the beginning. Uh, would have been useful um, when you talked about systematizing uh, the innovation process. Uh, we are perfectly aware that we have a lot of learning still to be done in that respect. We've been amateurs uh, so far in the systemic management uh, of our innovation system that we're developing. And again, we have so much that we still need to learn. And again, um, those projects uh, we now have on the portfolio, uh, we haven't been systematically uh, working on that, uh, first by listening to people and so on with uh, all the various stages. Uh, we are doing it now, but we were not doing it since the beginning. We're doing it now thanks to the deep demonstration. And then all this 
You talked about multi-level governance, and this again is an issue that concerns us. And I think we are doing things, important things, in this area. One thing, for example, has to do with uh, how we work with the different local development agencies. We work also in El Parraquín Lanean. We're working with the multi-level level governance with Lambide, with the Basque government, to promote employability, the employability of people in situations of exclusion. Uh, in Pasaya Relaps, they're also carrying out experiments uh, in the community, and the three different institutional levels are involved in that. And there are other examples as well, which uh, aim to involve different institutional levels. And there are specific uh, in examples of how the lessons learned are being in included in politics, in our policies. Olat was talking about how we're trying to increase the involvement and the participation of workers in their companies, worker ownership and participation in other forms as well. Uh, we have uh, reformed the tax law. And there's another project which seeks to promote uh, equality uh, among uh, different areas and different groups of the community. And then, of course, this is all at an experimental level and we need to scale that up to community level. But just, to, just some examples of some of the things that we're doing in some of the areas that have been mentioned. And Eddie, you wanted to say something, right? I'm just going to carry on now for two minutes. I think there's one question. I know that the president of the provincial council is here. Uh, you've just come in and just sat down, so I don't want to, you know, attack you the moment you've just arrived. But could you just give uh, us one thing? What would you recommend us not to do and why? So, uh, and then the, the young people, with relation to the young people, Telmo, could you tell me something uh, that has attracted you and has uh, attracted you to become involved in a Torquesune Reikis? I'm just going to start with you so that we give the president of the provincial council time to think of his answer. Attractive, what do I find attractive? Everything that has to do with designing the future. So, since uh, a, a very young age, I've really liked everything. Uh, that has to do with thinking about the future, designing things for the future. I've always been attracted by that. That's the interest that has attracted me. And this interest in the future uh, has to do with the role of young people in society. So I think this bridge between these two things, which has really uh, prompted me to come here today. I'm not a, perhaps a typical 23-year-old, um, but... I think I can speak, I don't know, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I think I do, I think, I think I can speak on behalf of the people I know in my environment, at least. There are people want to do things, they feel the need to do things, they want to be more involved. And how can we attract, I think you asked, no, asked how can you attract us to this type of initiative? I think... If uh, someone, uh, if you're thinking about Thur, the, the centre, uh, if you go to class and, you know, you explain it in a really boring way, you're not going to attract anyone unless you're really interested in, in the economy, for example. But what would be much better was for someone from Seward to come and explain what they do and then to organise maybe a hackathon or something, a, a, a morning that I can go there and work there and really re link what's happening in Seward with my experience of working there because 
there's a major gap between what I studied at university and then what's out there in the real world. So it's wonderful for us to be able to go and see what they do in that company. And if I see that, then I'm going to be much more interested in the project. So I'm never going to be interested in something that I'm not, I don't know. If I don't know anything about it, because I'm not going to be interested in it because I simply, well, if I don't know about it. How can I possibly be interested in it? So I think that's the first thing. And then it has to be something entertaining, something perhaps a bit more playful, more recreational, that you learn at the same time, of course, but the thing needs to have a reward. It doesn't have to be an economic reward. It can be a reward through participation. The moment that I participate, I learn, and I'm much more connected to what I'm doing if I'm just sitting there listening to somebody. Thank you very much, Delmo. Can I just very briefly say something? And depending on the uh, challenge... Uh, it's really important to include young people right from the very beginning. And maybe you could actually, I don't know, uh, create an advisory committee in which you have someone who represents young people. Thank you very much, Maria. We really do have to close. Before I pass the floor to the, pro the president of the Provincial Council, I know, Andy, you wanted to say something. I don't want to. No, no, no problem. I just wanted to answer uh, the question. What would you recommend us people not to do? Well, I would say don't do anything unless uh, you're prepared to be completely honest, intellectually honest and honest in the normal sense of the term, right from the very word go. You can't do something like Itorki Sunireki just as an exercise in political marketing. That would be my recommendation for something that you really shouldn't do. And we shouldn't also apply Itorki Sunireki and its logic to just some administrative uh, bubbles um, and you're talking about what citizens we were trying to reach out to. Um, uh, well, everyone, really. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Marco Lolano, President of the Provincial Council. You asked me a very hard question. I can't really remember what it was, to be honest. What would you recommend people not to do? Because on the basis of your uh, experience, I did remember the question. I just wanted you to answer it again to give myself a little bit more time. Um, I often talk about attitude and attitudes. We also think it's, it's very important to change attitudes and collaborative govern, governance at the end of the day uh, means that political leaders, and I don't actually consider myself a leader, I just consider myself a part of a team with a specific role, a specific function. But attitude is important uh, when you're trying to uh, connect up to different members of the community. What should we not do? Well, I don't think you should ever take anything to the limit. This attitude, my father uh, was uh, a woodworker and and you, you're with your chisel and you're making everything perfect. But there is at one point that you actually just have to strike it with a hammer. So this very soft kind of approach, um, which is important and so important in a process like this. But there is a limit to it because there are certain issues that you have to safeguard, that is something you actually have to do and you have to protect them. You have to know when to swap the chisel for the hammer. And sometimes you get to the critical moment in which you need to make a decision. And uh, this, uh, this isn't going, not everyone's going to like it, but you still have to make it. You still have to make that decision. I think this is another of the paradoxes of complexity. Yes, you were talking about that before. You can have a specific attitude, but paradoxically, you're going to just have to, at one point, have a different attitude because uh, otherwise things won't work. So I think that uh, the idea is that we have to accept uh, paradoxes but not be governed by them. What would you recommend us to do? Uh, n not to do, not 
accept paradoxes and what would you recommend people to I would recommend people to accept paradoxes right I do apologize uh, to all the panelists because I really haven't given you the chance to interact with the public but I'm very very grateful to you all for being here nevertheless it's a shame that um, we are running so short of time thank you very much for all your contributions and in general and thanks to the public as well for this very exciting very interesting panel Thank you.